Again, if we haven't met before, my name is Josh, one of the pastors here, and I'm so glad that you're in here in the room, or for those of you who are online as well, it's great to have you here with us today. What we're going to look at today is something which is simple, yet incredibly profound when you stop and think about it for a while. There's a simple thought that I want to share with you today, that is, without you, without everyone who's here, the next generation won't know what you know. There's no way to just take your whole life experiences and plump it down and then someone else will pick it up and know everything that you know. Without you, without who you are, what you've been through, your experiences, the next generation won't get a chance to know what we know. Now, if you aren't subscribed to Christianity yet or you still don't know where you stand with Jesus or you're new to this space, um, perhaps you're visiting uh, for the first time or revisiting, trying to figure out, is this a place that you want to be? Then today is a little bit of a, a family chat that you can just sit back, relax and listen in to. One of the great things uh, when it comes to the faith of those who follow Jesus is that for those of us that follow Jesus, there's a lot of stuff we got to do. But when you're still checking it out, you can sort of sit and you can decide, do I want to do that or not? Because um, it's something we have to do, but it's not something that you have to do. So we're going to have a little family chat today around some key things that we believe as a church is core to how it is that we are a church. So if you're new, you don't know if you follow Jesus, this is just a behind the scenes look at some of the things that make us who we are and that are really vital to how it is that we do church. So how do I start today's message? Manel, do you have something for me? Thank you. Does everyone know what's in the back? Onion rings. Onion, onion rings? <laughs> Oof, away from no. Onion rings. There's nothing in here. Manel needed a coffee and she could get this for me. Thank you very much for that. Manel, I appreciate that. That's my wife, Manel. Uh, if you don't know as well, we have four kids at the beginning of the service. I was trying to settle them. Um, two of them go into Pebbles. Two of them are into Jam. Thank you very much, kids. Volunteers, you guys are amazing. So, um, I grew up in a town of Kalgoorlie. Has everyone been to Kalgoorlie? Yep. Oh, look at this. Go, you guys. Did you have fun? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Work. School trip. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Um, I loved growing up in Kalgoorlie. It was amazing. Everything was close. On Sundays, you could play a sport, go to church, play a sport, go to a birthday party, and you were still fresh for Monday. It was amazing. I, 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 it was the best thing growing up there. Now, um, I'm going to talk to you about McDonald's for a second because it is one of the most important topics on earth. McDonald's. How many McDonald's do we have in Australia? Too many. <laughs> There's about four of you that said that. All right, all right. There is 1,043 McDonald's in Australia. Sorry. There is 1,044. No, sorry. 1,004. They're everywhere, right? And they are growing. There is one McDonald's per. 25,000 people in Australia, but not in Kalgoorlie. In Kalgoorlie, we're blessed. When I arrived in Kalgoorlie, there was no McDonald's, but I was also one year old, so I didn't care. When I left Kalgoorlie, there was two McDonald's, which is pretty good, right? Now, they were literally about a three-minute drive from each other, and there was nights where after, like, you would drive to one, ah, I forgot something, literally, because you're driving that direction, you go to the other one, to then go home. It was amazing. Now, if we had as many McDonald's in Australia as we did per the population of Kalgoorlie, it would mean that there would be another 750 McDonald's. Isn't that amazing? Now, I get what some of you are thinking. Josh, I came for a sermon not to learn that the market in Kalgoorlie is oversaturated for McDonald's. Do not open another franchise there. You won't work. Here's the point. McDonald's is able to do what they do because of what came before. Because of what has happened over the years and them doing what they're doing, they're able to, they've predicted over this three-year period, they're going to open another 100 stores in Australia. If you went back to 1975, whenever it was that they started in America and said, hey, you're putting your life, your blood, your effort, everything into this one McDonald's store, if I was to say to them back then and say, did you know that in 55 years across the world, there's going to be a country with 1,000 of your stores that are looking to open another 100 within a three-year window. They would have gone, Phew. impossible. And it doesn't matter where you look, whether it's at religion, retail, business, the military, education, past success generally 
is an indicator for the capacity of that organization. The reason any organization can do what they do now is because in the past, people built capacity into that particular organization. So I want to take you back to the beginning of the church. We call them the early church. And this is going to give you, we're going to have a quick look at how this offshoot Jewish sect came out to redefine our world. Because if you think these days, churches are everywhere, right? We have about 25 in the city of Kalamunda alone. It seems like if you and your buddy get together and say, let's start a church, you could probably start a church. But that's not how the movement started. It wasn't that simple. So this is how the early church developed. And it's uh, recorded for us in Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47. A man named Luke got his life changed by Jesus, so he investigated the life of Jesus. And he put together this document called the Document of Luke, which tells us about Jesus' life. And then he follows the early church through the book of Acts. And this is what it says, Acts 2, 42 to 47. So the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. They sold property and possessions and gave it to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread. They ate together. They were glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now that sounds great. They were moving. People were having food together. They were sharing what they had together. But there's also some background to that particular part of the story, which we don't get in the passage right here. At the time, the Roman Empire ruled over the people. So this wasn't a group of people who gathered together and said, we have complete autonomy to choose as we choose. They were under Roman occupation. So if the Romans came along and said, we don't like what you're doing, they would have to submit. They would have no choice. So they weren't free agents going, you know what, we really like this whole Jesus thing, let's just get together and let's do this. They had to consider the fact they're not truly free, they're under Roman occupation. The second thing is that there was no brand recognition for what they were doing, it was brand new. The fact that someone was dead and now is alive and people are running around going, can you believe it, God has done something new, this is amazing. They're talking to people and people are hearing this for the first time. If I say, hey, Do you know what Christianity is? In our context at the moment, some people would have a vague idea. They may have heard the term before. Back then, if they said, hey, do you want to hear about Jesus? They would have said, who? Yeah, I know Jesus, that guy over there. No, 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 a different Jesus. Yeah, this guy's pretty cool. No, no, this one's way cooler. And so they're going around trying to talk about him and everything. But people don't know anything about this other than the fact that it's connected to the Jewish religion. That's all they had. So they had no brand recognition. And the Jewish religious establishment was still very anti-Jesus. So as they were meeting, as they were gathering, the Jewish establishment, the religious leaders of the time, were looking at them and saying, we don't like that. And they were starting to stand in the way more and more and be more and more violent about it. So in summary, the early church launches out of this amazing thing that's happened. Jesus is no longer dead. But the Romans ruled, they had no brand recognition, and the established religion wanted them out. But against all odds, one person at a time, one conversation at a time, one prayer at a time, one gift at a time, sharing their faith one at a time, again and again and again, things started to change. And over 300 years later, this happened. Emperor Constantine of Rome delivered an edict that declared Christianity, which had been so violently opposed up until this point, that they are now a legitimate religion. So for 300 years, the early church had no Bible, No legitimacy, but one message. Jesus is alive. He changed my life. He can change yours. And they shared community together. But people didn't like that, and they were oppressed, oppressed, oppressed from the Jewish side, from the state side. And eventually, 300 years later, one conversation, one development at a time, Constantine, Emperor Constantine, stood up, delivered the edict that said, this is now no longer an outlawed religion of the empire. Then 80 years later, in the Edict of Thessalonica, Emperor Theodosius I made Nicene Christianity the state church of Rome. So you can imagine, it's a little strange. The empire that had ruled over the early church, who had persecuted them at points in their history, not only came to accept, okay, you're there and you're okay, but they actually came to believe the very things that they believed.
Now, if you're wondering, okay, well, how did this ragtag bunch of people who believe that a dead man came back to life go on to change the world in this way? Then let's go back to the story of the early church and have a look at what they did. And this is a paraphrased version of Acts 2, 42 to 47. This is what the early church were doing. They devoted themselves to learning, to hanging out, and to prayer. They had everything in common and gave to those in need. They spent time in each other's homes, eating together, thanking God, and enjoying good, healthy relationships. So the Lord added to their number. They did something that at the time was quite revolutionary, but today we probably take it for granted. See, they acted in a way which won friends and influenced people. They invited people to come and experience what they were experiencing. They were going around saying, my life has changed. I met Jesus. Before, my life was like this. I met Jesus through this group of people. Now my life looks like this. And they were going to their homes, to their workplaces, out in the streets saying, do you want to come and see what I have experienced? They were inviting people. They were serving. They served each other. They gave to those who had need. When someone said, I can't pay the bills. When someone said, I haven't got a job. When someone said, life's not going well. They came out together and said, well, someone here will have resource to help you. Let us serve you. And finally, they gave. They gave so that everyone's needs were met. And this, we would call it these days like positive social development, right? That's sort of where, what we would call it now. Back then, this was new. In a culture that said, might is right, the strongest win, and everyone should submit to the ruler, this group came together and said, actually, inviting, serving, giving, loving, those are the things that actually matter. And from Jesus' ministry, from his time on earth, from how he served people, a group of people became in love with the idea that God is for them, God is with them, and he has something better than the culture of the world. And they started to live in this way, that people went, I see that, I notice that, I want that. And for the last 2,000 years, many churches, we've taken our cue from the early church. And we continue to do three things, generation to generation. We invite, we serve, and we give. We invite, we serve, and we give. And the reason we do that is super simple. Because before we knew Jesus, for those of us who say I follow Jesus, before you knew Jesus, Someone invited you, someone served you, and someone gave to you. And so what you do in response to that is you receive that, and then you look and say, I'm going to invite, to serve, and to give, so that the next generation may know what I have found to be a freeing experience. It's what someone did for us, and in turn, turn, we do it for others. Because when you were there, for those of you who say apologies, when you were there going, does Jesus make a difference really? When you were asking the question, is Jesus really worth following? A community showed you, yes, yes he is. And as you became a part of a church community, people come and they ask the exact same question. Is Jesus really worth following? And you can answer because of what you have experienced. Yes, yes he is worth following and here is why I follow him. So we want to take our cue from the early church because he's made a difference in my life. Let me tell you, show you, serve you, and give so you can experience the difference that he can make in your life. I believe the difference that Jesus makes is that when you discover that you have been created on purpose and for a purpose, when you discover that God doesn't just create and leave you, when you see that he loves you and he's designed you for relationship and friendship, it changes how you live. It changes how you make decisions. It changes how you spend your time. It changes how you spend your energy. And what I've experienced and what I've experienced through others telling me is that again and again, when people put Jesus at the center, life begins to shift in a way that we can't always explain but that frees us, that gives us peace, and that brings us to completeness. That's the difference that Jesus makes. He's changed my life, and I believe he can change yours as well.
And my hope is, is that if we handed the microphone around to everyone who says they follow Jesus, they can tell you, this is the life, this is the difference he's made in mind. And so we invite people into that space and say, come and journey with us. So I'm going to switch gears. We're going to spend the rest of our time together saying thank you. I want to say thank you to everyone who does these things, to everyone who invites, who serves, and who gives. I want to say a big thank you because we couldn't do what we do without you. Lives cannot change without you, without our community coming together. A man called the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, would spend time to time in his letters thanking the people who supported the work that he did. And I just want to highlight and say thank you to everyone here who who does these three things. So, invite. Thank you so much to those of you who have invited someone to come and sit next to you on a Sunday. Now, if you're here this morning because you've been invited to sit next to someone on a Sunday, welcome. We're so glad you're here. One of the reasons that we're here as a church is because we want to be a space where people can bring people to sit next to them. So glad you're in this space. We are a church that does invite people. So thank you very much to everyone who has invited someone to come and be part of this community. Now, you might be going, Josh, you can say we're an inviting church, but are we actually an inviting church? Where's your stats and data? Here's the stats and data. Every year we take a survey of our church, and one of the questions on there is how many times over the past year have you invited someone to come and sit next to you on a Sunday? Of the 119, uh, 116 responses this year, 53 people said they had invited a family, a friend, or a co-worker to come and sit next to them on a Sunday. Can we give those guys a hand? Thank you so much. 53 adults took the time to say, hey, something in my church is worth coming to that you should come into. Why don't you come and sit next to me and let's do that together? 53 of you invited one or more people. And 15 of you invited four or more people. So you guys are superstars. Keep that up. That's awesome. Give them a hand. And what's exciting is that people didn't just ask the question and no one came. People have come. And the reason I can say that is because this year alone, I've had five people come up to me and they've said this. They they didn't say these words, but they all said this in their own way. I'm bringing someone to church this Sunday. You better not mess it up. (laughs) That's, That's what happens. Because for those of you who have not invited someone to church, you get used to it. Something happens up here that's weird, whatever. It's church. You grow up in church. I've seen everything. I've been from the super conservative with hanging out over here to the what's going on over here. And you get used to church. But when you invite someone to sit next to you, it's a different game. What songs are we singing? What's the sermon going to be like? What time are we going to finish? Is the coffee going to be good? You start to think very differently when you have someone sit next to you. Because... The truth of the matter is is that you did your part in inviting someone. We've got to do our part in making sure that there's something that God can do his part in. It's a teamwork. It's all of us. It's community. It's us partnering with God in this space. We have been and always will be a church that invites others so they can come and experience what does life with Jesus look like. So thank you. Serving to all of you who serve in our spaces. You may be wondering, what does it take to do what we do? So not just Sundays, you may only see us on a Sunday. During the week, we have other programs. Today, we looked at Roshana and what they have going over there. So what does it take to make Les Murdy Baptist Church happen? This is the answer. 134 people take time out of their weeks to come and make this happen. 134 of you. If we had to pay our volunteers to do the work that we did, we could not do what we do. Some of you serve once or twice a month. Some of you serve once or twice a year. But because of you, we are able to welcome, to sing, to have children's stuff. During the week, we're able to run a, um, we're able to run a program for zero to five-year-olds with music. We're able to do youth group. We're able to do midweek escape for over 55 to come and play badminton and hang out here. Because of what you do, we're able to be impactful in this community. Here are some of the ways people serve. Sundays and guest services, worship, kids, church, and kitchen. At our events through Alpha, church camp, women's and men's event, Be Rich, Easter and Christmas. In our next-gen space, we have our Pebbles, Jam, Youth Group, Music and Movement. Our life groups, we have so many. We have 11 life groups, so we have leaders there and we have hosts there as well. Thank you so much. Roshana, sitting with people and the Friday service over there. There's Murdy Community Care. We do hampers to chaplains. We do Be Rich. We have a food pantry. 
Maintenance, thank you so much for making sure the lawn's cut and when we occasionally have things break, thank you for coming around and helping fix them. Appreciate it. Thanks, Francois, for that. Uh, pastoral care, we have people who visit people, who take gifts and meals. And leadership in the governing board, the pastoral elders, the pastors, and the Claridge leadership team. One of the ways God chooses to grow our faith is when we serve and partner with him in the work that he is doing in our community. And also, a big thank you. There are people in our church who you may not serve here at LBC, but you serve in our community. Thank you for that. One of the biggest gifts our church can be to our community is not have all of the community come here, but have part of our church go out to the community. Some of you serve in other churches and things. Thank you for that. We're stronger when we work together. Just thank you when you choose to serve. So can we give a big hand for everyone that serves? You're awesome. You make it happen. And finally, give. Thank you for all of you that give to make what we do possible so that we can bring the good news of Jesus to our friends and our local city. Our city has over 25 churches in it. Can you believe that? That's a lot of churches. We have over 25 churches. It's great. We have uh, 60,000 people and over 26,000 people in the last census said they have no faith affiliation. No faith affiliation. One of my dreams, and so if you don't know, me and pastors from the other churches, there's about um, 13 churches that we network with, um, that we get to partner with in the city, and there's a few churches that we have relationship with, but we don't work on stuff together. Um, But one of my dreams is that as a network of churches, we can have an impact on our census, where we can have something happen, where we actually see the number of people who have no faith affiliation drop, and the numbers who say that they follow Jesus increase. Wouldn't that be amazing if as a church community we could do that? And you know what? If our church didn't grow because of that, I wouldn't even care. It's all about the kingdom-mindedness. If every other church in our area had more people coming into their spaces and they saw more life transformation and we just stuck as we were, amen. Good news. Because we're not in the business of making LBC big. We just care about Jesus in our community. And I thank God we have community church leaders that think the same way as that. When I meet up with them every month on Thursday mornings, one of the things we come back to again and again is, isn't it great we have a community that loves our community? A church that actually wants to impact our local community and not just look after ourselves. So together we can make a difference. And the only reason that we're able to be in that space, the only reason we're able to do what we do, is because we have a bunch of people at LBC that strategically plan to fund the work that we do as a church. So for those of you that give here, thank you so much. Strategic givers are people who have priority, percentage, progressive mindsets. Priority means you know the church matters and you have a plan to give. Percentage means you pre-plan what you give. And progressive means that as your wealth grows, so does your generosity. I have talked about it from the front before. As people in Australia get wealthier, our generosity goes down. The most generous people percentage-wise are the lowest income earners. Something happens there and it's not good. We just think it's all ours now and we don't, want to, we don't want to share it. So people who strategically give to the church, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Because of your generosity, we get to do everything here that we get to do. On top of this, we don't just have people that give here at LBC. We have people that give outside of LBC as well. Places that I'm aware of is Compassion. Hands up if you've got a Compassion kid. All right? Isn't it great work to see what Compassion are doing in, in the world? Some of you, uh, we've had Jason Lessels from Destiny Rescue come and talk about helping kids who are in vulnerable positions. Uh, He said that he has about 10 of us now that give into Destiny Rescue and helping children in that space. Missionaries overseas, people give to Baptist World Aid. Uh, Ed Devine will come and speak to us later this year from Baptist World Aid. But he updated me and said over our 20 years of partnering with them, the church has given them about $30,000 to do the work that they do which is great. And there's so many other causes that people are generous in, and that is such a good thing as a church. So thank you to all of you that fund what we do at LBC. We can't do what we can, we could without your generosity. Can we give them a hand as well? Thank you so much. Personally, I love being part of a church that prioritizes prioritizes reaching the next generation by inviting, serving, and giving. It's exciting. It's good. It's what we should be doing. So to wrap up today, if you don't follow Jesus or you're not interested or you're trying to figure out what this whole whole space is, then now you know the secret source to what makes church, church. We are a group of people that have met Jesus and because of that, 
We just invite people, serve people, and give so people can know Jesus makes a difference. He's made a difference in my life, and he can make a difference in yours as well. If you hang around here long enough, my hope is that you will experience that Jesus not only is real, but that God sees you, that Jesus loves you, and that you can experience friendship with him now and into eternity. And if you're someone who follows Jesus here this morning, that's what we get to do, isn't it? Isn't it cool? Great commission and great commandment. Just to use some insider language there. The great commission, Jesus said, go and tell people how cool is it that God is moving in this way. Go and tell the whole world. Baptize people. Tell them about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the great commandment. And as you do that, love each other really well. And the way that we do that practically is we invite, we serve, and we give. And let me quickly say, if you are someone who's followed Jesus for a long time and your faith has stalled, would you consider one of the reasons might be it's been a while since you've invited? Heck, it's been a while since you've served. And if you're being honest with yourself, it's been a while since you've given. And you're wondering, where is God and why isn't he doing what he used to do? And I'm just speaking for me because I go through seasons of this as well. God moves the most in my life when I'm inviting people to come to church. Because it's terrifying. It's hard. Yeah, Josh, you invite someone to church. Try it. Go to your friend who you know needs something more than what they're currently doing and go to them and say, hey, would you consider coming to church with me? If you have not done that in a long time, you will find that is a lot harder than it looks. Maybe you haven't served for a while. Maybe one of the times you felt closest to God is when you put your agenda to the side and you chose to serve other people instead. Or maybe in your finances, you're comfortable, life is good, but maybe God's asking you, partner with the church, partner with others, partner with your finances to impact the world around us. Maybe the reason you're feeling a little blasé in your faith is that you need a bit of a push. Because all those years ago, someone risked the conversation with you and invited you to come to church. All those years ago, someone risked their time and said, I'm not going to spend it on me, I'm going to serve you. And all those years ago, someone said, I'm going to prioritize giving so that you can come to know Jesus. They did their job, and now it's our turn. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you make a difference in our lives. And thank you that you don't just make a difference and leave us. You actually invite us to participate in making more of a difference. May we continue to hold that energy of the early church, to share what we have, to spend time together, to be generous in all things, and to care and serve for one another. Lord God, for everyone in our church, for everyone who is connected to our church through friendship or family, may they see and may we continue to experience you are here, you are real, and you want friendship with this planet. But for that to happen, we've got to invite, we've got to serve, we've got to give. In your name and for your glory. Amen.